Good afternoon. My name is uh, Harry Coleman. I'm the founder and CEO of Park Street. And it's my pleasure today to speak with you about why premium products are more relevant than ever today. Uh, so talking about premium products, uh, one thing that uh, we realized after you know, speaking with you know, different industry participants is that everybody has a slightly different perspective on what a premium product is. Some people are surprised at what low price points premium products are. And um, some, you know, just, you know, it's kind of like it's a little bit of a different definition for everybody. So what we thought for this presentation is to make sure we're clear about like what we are looking at. So if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, they would say it's like, no, premium is basically relating to or denoting a commodity or product of superior quality and therefore a higher price. So high quality and higher price. Now, Nielsen, uh, which deals with a lot of different consumer goods, uh, defines it as goods that cost at least 20% more than the average price for the category. The IWSR, somebody else uh, from the industry, goes in and uh, looks at uh, value at the bottom. Uh, it's kind of like 9.99 and below. And then standard, uh, 10 to 2249. And everything above, so the premium, 2250 to 2999. Super premium, 30 to 44.99. Ultra premium, 40 to 99.99. Prestige, 100 to 199. And Prestige Plus, over $200. These are all different type of premium categories. So for the purposes of this discussion here, of this presentation, we would just say premium product is not just the premium category of the IWSR, but everything in that box. So premium and above. So Prestige Plus product, we consider also a premium product. It's just a prestige plus premium product. So everything above standard is considered premium. Now, uh, let's look into the U.S. spirits market going into the pandemic. So basically, before the pandemic, the U.S. spirits market experienced steady growth with significant premiumization. So what you see on the left side is basically the, the distilled spirits market in the U.S. from 2000 through 2019. In million of nine-liter cases. So going from a little bit below 150 million cases to a little bit before, below 250 million cases over a 20-year period with a 2.9% compound annual growth rate. Very steady growth. If you look at the Great Recession years, so 2008, 2009, uh, it doesn't really look like a blimp. So it looks like it's a very steady growth. Uh, very attractive industry, even in difficult economic conditions. Now, on the right side, uh, you'll see the compound annual growth rates of these price bands that we just learned about at, uh, from the IWSR. So the overall growth rate with that vertical line there is 2.9% for the market. And so below that is really only the value. Value basically has shrunk over the 20-year period with minus 0.3%. Standard product up 3.1%. And then every of these uh, premium categories grew substantially faster than the market. And it's almost like a correlation, except prestige grew a little less than the ultra premium product. But overall, you could put a trend line in there and say, like, the higher the price point, the higher the growth rate, which is very interesting because this is over an extended period of time. And it really looks like that higher price points typically lead to higher growth rates. Now, that was all going into the pandemic. So what happened in 2020? So a terrible year overall with over 20 million uh, people that got infected, um, over 400,000 deaths in 2020 alone in the United States. By now it's over 500,000. Terrible numbers compared to uh, even like wars that the United States has been involved in. Uh, from an economic perspective, lockdowns you know, to slow down the spread, uh, keep the hospital capacities, uh, you know, like there for the ones that needed it most. So these lockdowns in the majority of states for extended periods of time, and then that all leading to 22. I mean, like, think about this number: over 22 million jobs lost in March and April alone. The S&P 500 lost around a third of its value in March alone. I think it was a 23-day period, actually, from uh, end of February to close to end of March. 
and around 20,000 restaurants and 3,500 bars permanently closed between March and August. Terrible numbers. Terrible for the entrepreneurs, terrible for the employees there. Uh, and I mean, economically, a terrible shock. And then the US uh, obviously entered a recession uh, with a second subsequent um, uh, GDP drop a quarter in the second quarter. First quarter, probably January, February, were actually not even down. It was just March was so devastating, leading the overall quarter to drop 5%. And then, I mean, an unbelievable high number of 31.4% drop in Q2. So the U.S. entered a recession that uh, did not look or would not look as a year in which any economic sector other than maybe healthcare would have a boom year. Now, there was a lot of discussion going on um, in the spring with regards to what type of recovery we have. If you were watching Bloomberg TV, there were tons of discussions going on constantly about like, is it going to be a V shape? Is it going to be a U shape? Is it going to be an L shape? Uh, and uh, the more I thought about it in preparation for this presentation here right now, I think it's really a K shape recovery. So there's a tale of two different recoveries. On the one hand, here at the bottom, it's basically a slow recovery with persistently high unemployment. So the unemployment rate in sectors that were affected were very high. And you know what? It didn't really change that much. There was still uh, a very slow recovery for a lot of people that were directly affected. And then there were others. There was a sharp recovery of economic conditions. So it's bifurcation. So not one economy. It's almost like two economies with two different types of recoveries. So let's look first into uh, the bottom of the K. They see the persistently high unemployment. So the unemployment rate rose sharply from 3.5% at the beginning of the year to 14.8% in April and stayed flat at 6.7% in November and December. So you see on the chart in the top right, you see the unemployment rate. And you see of like how it spiked up. Because January and February were kind of like unaffected. And then from March to April, what an unbelievable jump. And the devastating number is still that if you think about it, that the unemployment rate at the end of the year, where a lot of the lockdowns were loosened up and a lot of people felt like there was a kind of like a new normal, that this unemployment rate was almost double what it was at the beginning of the year. So many families negatively affected. Now, uh, if you look at the bottom right, so this is basically like by sector. So the employment losses by sector in February through April 2020 and February through December 2020 in percent. So the upper number is the bigger losses, which is a shorter period of time from February through April. And then the lower number is basically the one towards the end of the year. So there were industries that were directly affected by the pandemic. They were very careful in rehiring. As virus flare-ups, lockdowns, and other government restrictions were detrimental to business of affected sectors. So think about sports venues. So you know, some sports leagues went back to, hey, we, uh, you know, we operate again. The NBA is running, the NFL is running, but there's very few people there, and very few people work in in these environments. Uh, nightclubs are not open, so a lot of these sectors are heavily affected. So when you think about leisure and hospitality as the one right there on top. They almost lost half of their employment from February to April. This is a number that you have to really think about. Half of the industry was gone. And still at the end of the year, there was almost like a quarter of the industry still gone of that employment. So terrible numbers. Now, some other sectors like financial services, for example, there, it's kind of like 3.1% down and 1.1% uh, down for the year. Uh, this you know, I don't want to take it lightly, but overall, like, it doesn't even look like that there was that big of an impact. Now, on the other side of that uh, recovery, the sharp recovery, so you think about the stock market entered basically the bear market ter territory with this rapid drop at the beginning uh, of the pandemic. So the S&P 500 dropped over 33%. So you see on that graph on the top right how you know the daily closes of the S&P 500. So that was a steep decline you know, over basically like the four and a half to five week period where the market just dropped like a shoe. And then it came back. So what happened? So there was a quick action of the stimulus with total commitment to relief obligations in 2020 of over $4.4 trillion. So to put that into perspective, they see the relief obligations by the federal government 
was as high as all of the total federal spending in fiscal year 2019. So this is an unbelievably high number. Now, what does that stimulus do? Now, first of all, the stimulus was obviously not just the CARES Act that everybody's talking about from end of March. There were two stimulus bills before in March. Obviously, it was only $200 billion, but historically, $200 billion would have been a lot of money. But then followed by almost like another half a trillion dollars in April for more PPP funding and uh, close to a billion dollars at the end of the year with uh, the, uh, the additional coronavirus relief bill that was part of the omnibus, omnibus bill. Now, the stock market reacted. So there was a quick recovery rally, uh, the S&P back to a previous high by August. I mean, think about it. Like it's, the, the market is still, I mean, the economy is in a recession. And the market is already back to where they were before, the previous high. And end of the year, up 16.3%. So it was the sixth best annual return in the last 20 years. So in the bottom right, you see basically like the S&P annual changes for the last 20 years. And you know, like 2020, if you look at 2019 and 2020, it looks like a great economic expansion. If you look at it on an annual basis, it doesn't even look like that anything really happened other than a great economic expansion. Now, uh, what happened to distilled spirits? So distilled spirits did very well in 2020. And overall, if you think about it, the discussions, tons of discussions. We had like, so many discussions with brand owners at the beginning of the year that were fearing for their livelihood. Tasting zones were closed. They are key customers if they were focused on the on-premise, not operational. Really challenging environment. And overall, the overall industry basically came up with a record year, volume-wise, 7.5%, and a price mix growth of 5.6%. So overall, value-wise, it was basically over 13% growth. 13% growth, it's unbelievable. So now when you think about it on a month-to-month -month basis, on the top right, we see basically like, we looked at the NAPCA data here, because the NAPCA data for the control states, is just the... Uh, data that doesn't have that much noise in it. Well, it might underrepresent some of the smaller brands, but overall, it's a pretty good representative for the distilled spirits industry, and it's pretty accurate data because it's timely. And uh, so it was kind of like the January, February, it was kind of like a normal start into the year, but kind of like, you know, hey, there was some volume expansion and some price, uh, price mix, so some premiumization. Uh, but then in May, in March, it was a very different picture. Suddenly, the pantry stocking event basically led to a volume explosion and little to no premiumization. At the bottom right, you basically see the price mix change year over year by month, 2020. So this is basically like, we would say it's a proxy for premiumization. So some suppliers might have taken price, some consumers might have picked different type of products, more expensive products, if the number is positive. So in March, the lowest level of price mix for the year, 0.3%, and overall volume-wise, a 17% increase. So a big pantry stocking event. Look, we don't know how long we're going to be locked up for. We need to make sure we have some drinks. And we're going to order what we ordered before. Or we're going to we bought what we typically buy. No real change in uh, premiumization. Now then, uh, after kind of like volume-wise, April was kind of like a little bit of a normalization. People were still locked up at home. There was almost no growth compared to last year. And uh, premiumization came back a little bit in April. But then in May, from May to October, it was an unbelievable time. Not only were there four months of high volume growth, like June, July, September, and October, but the premiumization for six months period was extraordinary, way above average for the year. And historically, like six of the largest premiumization months ever. So we would call it, it was a vacation replacement trade-off. It was six consecutive record-setting premiumization months from May to October. People could not go on vacation. People might have had a, uh, a 401k that hit a record because the stock market was bad. People might not have lost their jobs. These people went in and bought higher end parts because they felt wealthier. Now, that is not the people that... Uh, in the K-shaped recovery, uh, at the bottom, they were still looking for a job. But stimulus checks might have helped. Stimulus packages might have helped. But overall, there were people out there that were actively looking for higher-end products. 
uh, and this is statistically very relevant. Uh, now, going into the holidays, funny enough, there was a market normalization. So volume growth was back to normal. The premiumization was still a little higher, but not anymore as high as it was in these vacation replacement trade-up months. Now, this premiumization surprised many. So they were, we talked with some of our clients. So it was like here, for example, in a CEO of an ultra premium tequila brand. It's so like, hey, we altered our highest sales predictions in 2020 by a factor of 5x. It would have been higher if we didn't run out of product at times. So they had a hard time fulfilling the demand. Then somebody else here on a super premium run brand, over the last 10 years, we tried everything in order to get the super premium run market to develop. Who would have thought that the only thing needed was a global pandemic? Maybe a little sarcastic, but overall, like, yes, that market got a big boost. Uh, and, uh, Somebody else from the tequila brand here, we benefited tremendously as we had inventory and some of our competitors had out of stock issues. We're there to satisfy demand and there was not that much marketing required. You had distribution, you had product, and consumers were there to buy your product. Now, what's the expectation with regards to the future? So, there will likely be inflationary pressures on the luxury end of consumer goods, similar to the time after the Great Recession. And it might be higher because the overall stimulus commitment, and this doesn't even take into account the discussions that we're having right now or that are happening in D.C. right now about additional um, stimulus packages. So we have $4.4 trillion today, and they're talking about possibly adding maybe close to $2 trillion, maybe a trillion dollars. This number becomes much bigger, and it's significantly bigger than what the federal government committed to uh, after the Great Recession. So uh, after the Great Recession, if you look at the right side of this graph here, so this is basically above premium spirits from the IWSR. So everything that we talked about, what is premium, okay? So basically the growth rate from 2010 to 2019, you know, high growth rates. Overall, above premium spirits, basically more than doubled in the 10 years following the Great Recession. The growth rate of above premium spirits was 3x the overall market growth rate. So now, do we think we're going to have more vacation, you know, replacement trade up uh, months or years like we had in the six months over the summer last year? Maybe not. But overall, we will probably have a very long period of time of way above market growth for above premium spirits. So I would say we're probably in for the golden age of super premium or above premium spirits. Now, there is a high level of uncertainty with regards to what the impact the return of the on-premise will have on the utilization. So there is pent-up demand for going out, socializing. You know, people are sick and tired of just drinking alone on their own, you know, at home. Uh, you know, having people back at their houses, but also going out, going to nightclubs, going to bars and restaurants. Um, it will have an impact. Now, the question is, will the ratio of like where a consumer maybe last year thought about, look, when I used to go out, I had a premium cocktail for $50. If I buy a super premium tequila at $60, uh, that's a steal. I, you know, like I get 20 drinks out of that bottle. It's only four you know, on-premise drinks, the price. So that makes sense. Now, if I go back and that new tequila that I started to like uh, in the on-premise might have a, a price for the cocktail at $20 or $25, will I bark and will I go back to a lower-end product? I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see my hypothesis is that it won't happen. Now, some of the categories that have been more challenged uh, last year that were, you know, still higher growth on the higher premium end, but not as extreme as others. So if you think about, for example, the difference between tequila and mezcal, so um, mezcal did not reach the growth rates of super premium tequila. It might have been super premium tequila didn't need as much explanation of a bartender that mezcal needs. So mezcal, to commit to a bottle of mezcal, while it's less known, might have been more challenging than on the tequila side. Now, with the bartenders being back and being able to provide their valuable insight and you know their capability set, these categories will likely be in for a large boost to premiumization as well. So my hypothesis is that uh, if you want to play anywhere over the next 10 years, it's probably in the very high-end price points. Uh, and there will be categories that don't exist today. It's kind of like the chicken and the egg problem. Somebody will come up with a new super premium price point for a particular category that somebody would say, look, this is insane. You know, who would ever buy you something like this? And we'll be surprised. We'll look back after the end of this decade, and that will be a very, very different landscape. 